I listened this past week and viewed it to a sermon that was coming from a blasphemer, blasphemy speak against God, and I didn't, haven't heard much more blasphemy than I heard in that sermon because he simply stood before his audience and said, you have been deceived. Jesus Christ did not rise from the dead and then went on from there all along. Today is Mother's Day. It's been a day set apart since about the early 1920s. Of course, we know from the New Testament, this is the first day of the week, the Lord's Day, in which, in which the New Testament instructs God's children to come together to worship Him in spirit and in truth. And yet, it's good to have a Mother's Day, but I ask myself sometimes the question, how many people have been deceived? They biologically have born children but they don't know the first thing about what it is when it comes to the responsibilities of a mother. First of all, many of them never have been married, <clears throat> and thus they know nothing about what the Bible teaches or they don't care to know, or if they know, they set it aside. And on and on you can go on the fundamental truths of the Bible on marriage and the home and responsibilities husbands and wives and fathers and mothers and children, and so many other things. One of the things that if you're going to be, and I was trying to think how I would approach this morning because I wanted to say something about mothers. And if you look up various whatevers about mothers and Mother's Day, it's all some sort of ooey gooey, ippity booey, whoopsie doodle, sugar and sweet. I can't repeat that, so don't ask me to. <laughs> Unless it's the ooey gooey, sugar and sweet. Now, I'm not opposed at all to talking about good memories of mothers who did what the Bible said, who did what the Bible said. And I mean concerning wives and mothers. But how many people know what that is today? And how many people who are roughly in their teens and 20s and 30s and even 40s, who even had mothers, much less fathers, who understood at all what the home was all about, as to how God set it up to be the unit, basic unit, smallest unit of society. Well, they followed off after this, that, and the other, and none of it from the Bible, and they've done things that suited them. They've done it their way. Now, this next passage I'm going to read we usually think of it when it comes to what must I do to be saved from my sins, the church, its organization, work and worship, and so on. But covers far more than that. Paul told Timothy as a young evangelist, now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in latter times some shall depart from the faith. How did they do it? Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. And he goes on to describe certain early points and particulars about the apostasy that he spoke of. I'm concentrating on verses 1 and 2. You see, that doesn't just cover how one is saved by God and when through Christ. Or the church, the place of the Bible is the only authority and so on. It also covers the home. It also covers marriage. It covers the responsibilities for husbands and wives, fathers and mothers and children. So the greatest danger I was thinking for any of us, but now I'm applying this to mothers nowadays, Wives and mothers is believing a lie and being deceived. There's the truth. 
There's falsehood. They're not the same. We talked about that last Sunday when we spoke about the truth. Truth and lies are not on the same plane. The Bible speaks so much about the truth, our being honest with ourselves to make sure we know the truth and to reject what is contrary to the truth, to not be deceived by believing and obeying a lie as Mother Eve was long ago in the garden. And yet it's happening all around us. Often we preach from a pulpit, our pulpits in the land, concerning morals, godly conduct, godly homes, what marriage is and so forth. Who's eligible for marriage? But I want you to think of this as to a fundamental basic part of instruction in the home and that it doesn't rule out the father's place in the home. That's for another sermon. The father's the head of the house. And the wife, under his love and care as he loves her, as his own flesh, even as Christ loved the church, gave himself for it. Paul said it's to guide the home. She's with the children all the time in a way a father is not. Now, that doesn't mean fathers haven't abdicated their responsibility and duties too, but we're not talking about fathers. We're talking about being deceived as it applies to mothers. Now, if I drop the name Bruce Jenner, that brings all sorts of things to your mind if you keep up with anything over the past many years. Because Bruce Jenner is a man who claims he always felt he was a woman. I've always found that interesting because he married three times and has six children, two from each marriage. Uh, I think his words and his actions are not quite consistent. There have been others, and all over the place today, you know, it's a big deal, transgender. You're what you think you are. So if you think you're a coconut, that's what you are. I would say they would be right from the standpoint of nut. There's a core problem. These people's claims do not match the facts of who they are. But that's where we live today. Feelings are claimed to triumph or trump, I should say, facts. Or to triumph over facts. Either way. What you think, how you feel. Now, that's the way our society's going. So this matter of 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2 not only covers being sure you're right on how to become a Christian, when you become a Christian, et cetera, et cetera, but it covers also the responsibility of mother and father and mother who guides the home. I use an old adage that's a very trite one, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world, and that's so true. The obligation of the mother in performing her duties as a mother to her children. She cannot afford to be deceived, to believe such stuff as we're talking about. Yet it's going to bombard the home and your children. You send them to public schools in so many places, they're going to be taught very subtly many times, and other times not so subtly. That if they feel so strongly as a little girl about being a boy, then I shouldn't hinder them, and vice versa. Mothers, to be a mother that ought to be honored on this day, you're going to have to love the truth. You're going to have to love the truth more than you do your husband. And you're going to have to use your guiding hand to lead those children and teach those children, instruct those children, and rebuke those children. A little child comes in and says, well, I, I think, I've been thinking a long time, Mama, and it disturbs me. I really think I'm a little girl. The little girl says, I think I'm a little boy. There was a time 
when if children came into home because society was much more stable and grounded overall in generalities and biblical concept of the home, father and mother, and teaching and training and discipline and so forth. <coughs> to where a mother would have said, you get that out of your head or I'm going to slap it out of your head. Now, that's not the only answer. But I'm saying that's the strength that used to be within the home and the thought in the mind of the mother as well as the father of what ought to be instilled in those children's minds as you teach them to think and not to swallow whatever the teacher's saying at school or teachers are saying at school or all the little things they put up on the bulletin boards to make you go the wrong direction or all the little things that children are saying. Several years ago, this goes back probably close to 15, 20 years ago, I talked to a career teacher who was about ready to retire and glad of it, who was talking about at that point how that this talk of homosexuality was so much that it had become the end thing to be for the boys to act like homosexuals and so forth. And in reality, a lot of times they weren't. It was just a, a, a fad. Well, we've had fads when I was in high school. I remember the fad uh, that uh, uh, some of you, Ken, you may remember this. Maybe you never stopped it at your school. But I remember when everybody wore their blue jeans, and that's mostly what they wore to school, and they just rolled them up in cuffs on the outside. But then that got to be, you know, you were backward if you rolled them up. So you didn't have a cuff. And you rolled them under, and if Mama didn't sew them up for you to where they didn't have a cuff, you straight pin and stuff. Stick them through there to make sure, but boy, don't roll your bridges legs up. That was bad. You wouldn't fit in. Well, that's a mild thing. You go on and on, think of all sorts of things and fads that, uh, that have been around. Some of them are not good, some of them good. But we're talking about something here that has to do with truth and falsity and being deceived into believing a false thing is true. And how do you get into that stage? Well, I feel this way. Are you in touch with your feelings? Now, that started back when I was a teenager, especially in my college years, with the hippies. You ever remember some of you older folks that they were trying to always find themselves? <laughs> you remember that? And uh, most of them all went to San Francisco, or at least that was the center of going to find yourself, and they're still out there trying to find themselves. <laughs> Only they're probably my age now. <laughs> These things have gone on, but the thing about it is every time they surge in society, they pick up a few more, and it gets settled in, and more people reject the biblical concept of marriage and the responsibilities of father and mother and especially the wife. But I have known over my lifetime a number of wives whose husbands never were anything they ought to be. And yet, they did what God said mothers ought to do. Many times it caused a great deal of problems. But they did what the Bible said mothers ought to do. They were handicapped in a lot of ways, but they worked through them. They still were determined to train, to teach, to set a godly attitude and example before their children. And it was a struggle. But we're all, when we're said and done, we're all individuals. And even we come up from a corrupted family, if there was a family there, or we called it a family, individual. Responsible, not for the likes blinking, but I'm still responsible for being before God what God says I ought to be. Now that brings up something else. One of the deceptions or lies is that, and it's true of social things, because of the society, it's somebody else's fault. That's the reason I said, don't blame me for the lies, it's not my fault. 
And in that case, it's true. But you look around about you and you will see everybody's pointing fingers at everybody else. Now, if you studied history, Abraham Lincoln was held up as a fine example of one who had very little but developed by his own determination to do what he knew was necessary to be an educated man. And we would say, and this is where this comes from, he pulled himself up by his own bootstraps. Today you won't hear that. But mothers need to instill within their children, you can be what God says you ought to be no matter what. And you can. There's one thing for sure. If you live a normal lifetime, your mother won't be around always. Your father won't be around always. Some of us know that. I still want to remember mother and daddy up in Arkansas being what they were when they were able to go around. Same thing with Jody's mother and daddy. I look at a picture she has on, on the refrigerator from time to time with them over there in their kitchen, and I still want to think of them as being there. Well, I can wander off into a la-la land and try to make believe they're there, but they're not. That works also from this standpoint. My family was worthless, never did try to be anything else. That's what happens with some people. Well, what does that have to do with you and your personal choices? Well, I may handicap you, and you may have to work through some things. Somebody that had... Parents that would rear them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord won't quite have to work through. But everybody has to come to the conclusion, I've got to do what's right, and I'm the only one that can do it. Now, mothers, when daddy's out there working hard, even if he's all that a husband ought to be and father ought to be, you're the one that's going to have to instill in them the idea that you do what's right no matter what. So that ties in with 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2. There are plenty of people out there speaking lies and hypocrisy who have their conscience seared with hot iron when it comes to morality, when it comes to those type things, when it comes to the home and what it ought to be. I read yesterday in looking through some things that parents... Every year in America, and this is a small number, but one's too big, that recent statistics from Brown University have parents killing their own children, as many as 500 a year. Their own biological children, not stepchildren, their own biological children. Be interesting to go into all the details of why each one did that, but think about that. What makes a person reach that stage? I don't know all the reasons. But I know they did not with sanity and guidance from God's good word do it. The same study said that fathers kill more of their children than mothers did. Well, those are just facts. The point is, what makes people turn out the way they are as to, let me ask you mothers, what guides you? What is your goal in rearing children? You're going to have to teach your children to stand on their own two feet. By that I mean to think independently in the light of the truth, which truth you must lay down and teach them by example, and by instruction. When it comes to somebody like Bruce Jenner and that whole crowd, they can say what they want to. They can do all sorts of things. But when you check their DNA, it's male. When it comes to a man saying, well, I just feel like I'm a woman trapped in a man's body. No, it's, it's uh, no matter what you think. What it comes down to is that people like that are mentally sick. So mothers, you have a responsibility not to let your children be mentally sick. Now that covers far more than this transgender business. That covers setting their path on the, their feet on the path that's the straight and narrow way of truth in viewing everything. 
you look at Jenner and all those like him and, and all of his medications and surgeries have done is simply put on a sophisticated disguise. It doesn't change who he is, only how he appears. And yet if, if you were to be dealing with him, he would not want you to call him him. Well, I'm not going to accommodate them on that. I would be lying to them if I said you are her. And I know where Revelation 21 8 says lies are going. Well, I can't reach out here and just with a sweep of my hand change a whole great number of people. But I'm talking about the individual family unit and the responsibilities of mothers who are with their children, who are with their children closer than even fathers are, being trained in these things that you thought at one time would you'd never have to be trained in. Letting little boys be little boys and little girls be little girls. Encourage the little girls in feminine things. Little boys in masculine things. Now, when I say that, what's going to come out of our society and is today is this. Well, you're a man and you have your idea of what a woman is, so your idea of what a woman is is a masculine idea and she needs to reject that. That's why you've got people saying that our society, and I don't mean just America, but all over the world, basically Caucasians from Europe, Caucasians from here, wherever you find Caucasians, that a white man is just, or a woman, a white person is just immediately, because you're born, a little baby six months old has built in him, according to this false doctrine, That any other race, any other ethnicity is worthless. How in the world can you read your Bible and believe that? Knowing it's infallible, the inerrant, the all-sufficient, final revelation of God to man. And that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished into every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. When I read my Bible, as far as the human hands, their ethnicity, none of them were like me. Not a one of them. But God wrote the Bible. He inspired each individual, regardless of his ethnicity or his nationality, to write down what he wanted down there so it is God's word. And when Paul, who was a Jew, and he said he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, ethnicity, in his ethnicity, he wrote God's word. When Moses wrote, same thing's true, and so on and so forth. I pointed out to Ken the other day something I came across. It's dawned on me a while back. Do you know, except for the race of man, the human race, race is not even mentioned in the Bible. You ever notice that? Race is not. Nations are, and peoples are. And you know, that it has always been there, but it's like a lot of things, it's always been there. We don't see the implications of it till later on something happens and it smacks us upside the head. When you look over at Paul's teaching in Acts 17 to all those Greeks he was a Jew and they heard new things so they brought him to the Areopagus wanted to hear all these particular things listen to what he said to them in verse 26 as Luke records it by inspiration verse 26 of chapter 17 he says this about humankind he hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth. Let that sink in. Take that information. Process it. And you won't see red, yellow, black, and white even mentioned. Not there. So when somebody comes up 
with the idea that just because you're born black or born brown or born white or yellow, whatever, that that makes a difference in you that you can't help. You're just that way. Just don't be deceived. Because it's not that way. I, tell me the, the ethnicity of Adam and Eve. What do they look like? What did Noah look like? The point is, the Holy Spirit through Paul said he's made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the fall of the face of the earth. And as long as your blood type matches another person's blood type, I don't care what ethnicity or nation he's from, if you need a transfusion, that'll work. And yet we're being told if you feel a certain way, then that's just the way that it is. The transgender movement claims that people are what they claim to be regardless of contrary evidence. Now, immediately, how it rejects facts. How it destroys an absolute object all men are amenable to, to know right from wrong. It leaves it up to everybody how you feel. If I go out here and stand in this rain today and get soaked to the skin, if I don't feel wet, you see, I'm not wet. I hope mothers have enough understanding to take simple illustrations like that and teach their children that feelings do not trump facts. If they say that, just stick them out in the rain and say, how do you feel now? There's some things we just need to know. Think about this. You ever heard of children use bad language and mothers washing their mouth out with soap? Now think about that. What is the relationship to actually washing the physical mouth out with soap to stopping them from that which comes from the mind of saying wrong things? It, 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 it's doing this. It's saying, now you can make an attachment between the brain if you've got the sense of a goose and what I'm doing to you to remind you you're not to use foul language, filthy language. We don't do that because it's wrong. and We don't do it because God doesn't want us to do it. And you'll remember this. It seems to me that somewhere back down the road, and all you have to do is watch the Little Rascals. Anybody ever heard of Little Rascals? Our gang. Most of them made back 20s and 30s and into the 40s. Watch what some of those kids get into and watch the punishment they get. Worked pretty well. Mothers, don't be deceived into thinking that you've got to let your children do what they want to do. Now, we're already conditioned to that must realize we're already in a permissive society and have been for a long, long time. If kids push enough, people give in. So if kids push enough saying as a little boy, I feel so strongly about a little girl, I don't want a pair of pants to wear, I want a dress. What are you going to do? Say, well, he nags you all the time. He wants makeup. He wants to do this, that, and the other. What are you going to do? That's what you're going to do. <laughs> you're going to thunder. But I might remind you that the thunder does not have the killing power. It's lightning that makes the thunder, and you need to be the lightning. And I don't mean it's all corrective discipline. You have to instruct. You have to teach. You have to set an example. But you've got to deal with it and not give in to it. And then you'll be a God, begin to be a godly mother. Truth is simply opposite of lies. Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 5. We are dealing with lies on every level of our own existence today. And every lie demands that you deny the facts in the case. Proverbs 12 19 says truth endures. Lies will not. Truth is consistent. Let me ask this. Why should sex be determined differently in humans than in other mammals? That doesn't seem to be a problem. How many times have you been around, you found the old cat, she's had kittens. Or you find the old mother dog, and she's had puppies. 
and there's four, five, six puppies. There's three or four, five kittens. And you get out there and you go, it's supposed to be a kitten. Tom, female, and that works right on up with horses, donkeys, and goats, and so on. And you know, when you're ordering chickens, they got to have people there that can sort of sex those chickens. That's what they talk about. Which sex are you getting? Are you wanting little chickens to grow into layers? And the people back there at the hatchery said, well, I just looked at all those chickens. And I think every one of them are layers. Oh, they'll grow into it. And so you send those out. Next thing you know, in a few months, you've got a bunch of chickens trying to crow. But they felt like and they thought they're going to turn into layers. But they weren't. They were roosters. And on and on you can take those simple, simple, simple things. But you can, mothers, teach your children every day, all day long about the matter. And you can end up showing God made humankind male and female, Genesis 127. And you're going to have to do that. You can't assume that's right always. They're going to be bombarded out here in the schools by these people who have been persuaded along those lines. Well, I'm running out of time. I've got a lot more I want to say, but I'm going to say a few more things. The American Psychological Association is stating that gender identity is, quote, a person's internal sense of being male, female, or something else. Now, think about that for a minute. It's your internal sense of being male, female, or something else. What is the something else? A tree? A squirrel? Exactly what does being male or female feel like? Let me ask you that. That's subjective. What does it feel like to be a female? What does it feel like to be a male? In fact, what does it feel like to be a horse? Or a cat. Somebody is saying, I feel like I'm short. So I think I can walk through a small openings. So I'm just short. I can walk right under these benches and never duck. Well, protect me from you. Now, Ken, if he were to come along and say, I feel like I'm 14. Nancy would straighten that out. <laughs> now, now you, you think I'm being just facetious. That's, that's exactly what we're being taught. That's permeating society. I feel like I'm a Native American, so that means I must be, and so I try to join a tribe. I don't know what they do if the tribe decides you're not. I guess you make your own tribe. At some level, transgender activists understand this. At some level, they're never consistent in the application of their so-called guidelines in everything. Thus, they insist that gender identity is innate, and I'm quoting, or established at a very young age and therefore immutable. But then they claim, quote, that gender is a purely social construct. Now, remember what we've been saying back here in our class. A social construct. You cannot have it both ways. Because social constructs constantly change. One imaginary gender is, quote, gender fluid, unquote. Now, how can a gender be fluid and yet at the same time immutable, which means it doesn't change? A lot of these things mothers can do at home by just simply common sense looking at things around about them in the house with their children but you're going to have to do that and then as best they can according to their age teach them the truth of God's will well I'm going to have to stop here but I'm saying this is an area in which we in the church and being faithful to God as Christians have got to come to grips with and we talk about the home as God would have it in restoring the home as the New Testament and the Bible teaches it. You're going to have to deal with these things. You cannot suppose it's doing it for you. The public schools overall, that changes from community to community somewhat, have been captured by this kind of stuff. It's been going on for years. 
and the people who control these things, it's in governments and higher education, they're controlling all of it. And they're putting upon us the big lie that's contained by a multiplicity of lies. If I believed in the kind of thing that this teaches, I could not do what I'm about to do. And that is, as we close the lesson, offer the invitation of the Lord to become a Christian. Because you can know from God's infallible word what God requires of you to become a Christian, how to identify a Christian, know whether you are a Christian and when you became a Christian. And as a Christian, know whether you're living godly lives. But I speak to the mothers. The same book that teaches you that teaches you also what's involved in that hand rocking the cradle to instill in little boys their manhood as they grow into it and the little girls the same and understand how to do it. If you're not a child of God, we urge you to believe with all your heart that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. Repent of your sins. Confess your faith in the Christ as the Son of God. And be buried with your Lord in baptism to obtain the remission of sins. That's the only plan of salvation there is out there. And it doesn't make any difference how you feel about it otherwise. When you take all of what the Bible says in its immediate and remote context, rightly divided, I've set out to you the plan of salvation. There is no other. As a child of God, when you sin, there's only one way to be right with God. Repent of those sins, confess them, and pray God for forgiveness. There is no other way. You can feel any way you want to feel. But the truth is objective and absolute, and you can attain it when it comes to knowing what pleases God and knowing whether you are or you're not. So if you're subject to the invitation of our Lord, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.